From an Iraq war cover-up to towns ravaged by opioids to the roots of our modern immigration crisis, Embedded explores what's been sealed off and undisclosed. NPR's original investigative podcast reveals why these stories and the people behind them matter. Listen to the Embedded podcast only from NPR. Support for this show comes from Alpine Bank. 50 years young, 20 years green. Proud to support Parched from Colorado Public Radio. Learn more about Alpine Bank's history of community service and its green team at alpinebank.com. Support for Parched comes from Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, whose mission is to deepen understanding and promote conservation of alpine plants and fragile mountain environments. Learn how to support these efforts at bettyfordalpinegardens.org. The iconic image of a cactus is a tall green trunk with those arms reaching out to the side, pointed up with spines all over. It's basically the emoji for the state of Arizona. It's actually a specific type of cactus called a saguaro. They only grow in the Sonoran Desert, which includes southern Arizona. Near Tucson, there's a national park dedicated to this cactus. Look under the plants and you'll see other little babies. Tiny little cactus. So, saguaros can't grow unless they're under another tree. Most people notice the size of saguaros, their height and how they stick up like thousands of fingers on hillsides and across vistas here. But a hiker we met out here, Hattie Mathers, she's different. She comes looking for tiny ones. She squats and almost crab walks around this dry brown trail. She does this several days a week. The heat is so hot. All these plants protected the baby. So that's a plant being nursed by the plant above it. Look at this. I mean, there's just so much life. And pack rats. Oh, if I see a pack rat, how much show you? I love this place. But you didn't know this. So, a saguaro does not get an arm until it's 60 or 70 years old. So that saguaro you're looking at could be several hundred years old. Hattie moved here from the Midwest and fell in love with this desert. My producer, Rachel, started chatting with her out on the trail. How do you describe this area to someone? Like, what do you say? I tell my friends that the desert is alive with life and that it's full of life and teeming with life, teeming. And that everything, including those of us who live here, have learned to adapt. And I come here and I'm full of hope, personally. I really am. Rachel was drawn to Hattie's perspective on the desert. They kept hiking to a viewpoint. You look out here, you see thousands, if not millions, of cacti that have been living for hundreds of years. Makes me think, they're going to survive, right? They're going to keep going. Yeah, you know who's going to go extinct? (laughs) We are. The desert will keep living. The desert means things will change. You know, some animals won't make it. But the desert lives on. People can go extinct. That's why we all have to be responsible. From CPR News, this is Parched, a podcast about people who rely on the river that shaped the West and have ideas to save it. I'm Michael Elizabeth Sackis. Being here in Tucson, exploring the desert, it's serene. I love the sound of the ground crunching under my feet. These magnificent saguaros remind me how scarce the water is in the Colorado River and this whole area. The way we deal with scarcity, with supply and demand generally, is price. If things are scarce, there's a price to pay. Whether it's 
Beanie Babies or Cartier Diamonds. But water is not like that. It's disappearing with climate change. But that's not reflected in the price we pay. It means we don't have a motive to adapt the way the cacti have. So in this episode, we explore one of the thorniest ideas on the table, to raise the price of water as it gets scarcer. Tucson is at the heart of this tension around raising the price of water. It sparked a lot of debate and experimentation here for decades. Robert Glennon, who's a law professor emeritus at the University of Arizona, is firm where he stands on it. Robert moved here in the 80s and has gotten really passionate about the Colorado River. I've spent a lot of time fly fishing the Colorado, a lot of time whitewater rafting the Colorado. I've done the Grand Canyon twice in my own boat, and I've done a number of the other tributaries in my own boat. You've actually boated the Grand Canyon in your own boat multiple times. At the oars, yes, yeah. And scared the bejesus out of me every time. (laughs) The first time, I flipped in the first rapid in the river. Oh, wow. (laughs) The very first rapid? The very first rapid, yeah. (laughs) Robert's a water law expert. His small office is lined with bookshelves with hundreds of titles. I never knew there were so many books about water. On the walls, he doesn't have any diplomas for any of his advanced degrees, but he's hung up his Eagle Scout certificate. I was, you know, a nerdy little kid who liked the outdoors. Now that he's well past scouting age, Robert has gray hair and wire-rimmed glasses. Besides the books and the certificate on the wall, there's a map. It's a detailed illustration of the Colorado River. So when you look at this map and you see farmers and ranchers and cities and tribes and all the different communities and all the different ways that they use water, when you think about how we're paying for this water and, and the prices we're putting on water, you know, what, what goes through your mind when you see all the different ways we're using water on this map? Uh, mostly that we're not paying for it. We wake up in the morning, we turn on the tap, and out comes as much water as we want for less than we pay for cell phone service or for cable television. Most Americans, when they think about water, they think of it as the air, as though it were infinite and uh, inexhaustible, when in fact, it's finite and exhaustible. Robert wrote a book called Unquenchable about the hard choices we have to make to ensure a clean and adequate water supply over the long term. Robert advocates that conservation, as well as other things like recycling our water and desalination, need to all be part of the mix. He says the price of water and the ways we charge for it also need to be in that mix. Even when you write a check to the local utility, it's not for water, it's for the cost of service. So it's for the cost of the utility to pump the water, treat the water, deliver the water. There is no charge for the commodity of water, none. So even if your water bill goes up, it's probably because your water provider needs to upgrade its system. It's not because the water itself is getting more expensive, even though it's more precious. That's where Robert sees opportunity. Pricing water is a very important tool going forward. But in his public talks, Robert ends up sounding kind of like an odd man out. Public officials generally aren't willing to advocate for higher water prices. It makes people uncomfortable. Think about how it would look on a campaign mailer. Robert is one of the few voices saying loudly... He believes most of us pay too little for water and need to be more strategic in the future. When I'm on the stage in a, you know, a panel situation with an elected official and I start talking about price, the elected official's eyes kind of go wide open and looking around for the chief of staff. Why, why am I on the stage with this guy who's talking about raising water rates? But, you know, 
I don't care about that. And the reason why I don't care about that is because I have tenure. There you go. <laughs> and, you know, elected officials, in, not in the Q&A, but afterwards, you know, come up and chat and tell me, this, this is a big lift for me to do this. I said, I know, that's why I'm trying to do it for you. You know, because I can. I can speak freely about it. He keeps speaking up because there is evidence increasing water prices can work. In fact, it's been done before, right here in Robert's hometown, Tucson. Back in the 1970s, some city leaders felt they had no choice but to charge people more for water, even though it was a really unpopular idea and would cost them politically. Margot Garcia was one of them on the city council. She's retired now and still lives in Tucson. So I asked her if we could talk at her house. And your name is? Michael. Michael. Yeah, Michael, yeah. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Yeah, what a beautiful home. Well, thank you. Uh It is on the National Register, and it's a real mud adobe, sun-baked adobe. Margot lives in an upscale neighborhood. The front of her house has gorgeous manicured desert landscaping. In the back, Margot has some trees and a naturally growing area she doesn't water at all. So when you moved into this house, this landscape looked a lot different, right? Absolutely. It was a lawn from one end to the other. We have, it's called, we call it a food forest. So we deliberately put in plants that will give us a return for the water we put on them. And also some shading on the house. Also prominently displayed outside is a yard sign that says Climate Action Now. Margot was a young mom and already a vocal environmentalist when she ran for city council in 1975. It was her first time running for office. Water was not at the top of her agenda. When I think about the things that I put on my campaign material, It was more bicycles, um, more waste management. The priority she put on water changed pretty quickly once she got elected. How did it become an issue for you? Well, the city manager came and said, we have a big problem. The water table was dropping about a foot a month. These days, Tucson uses the Colorado River. But back then, the city relied entirely on groundwater which gets pumped to the surface from underground sources like aquifers. Farmers or communities could pump groundwater from these wells, however much they wanted. We were overdrafting. We were taking more water out than we were putting back in from the rainfall. We knew we were pumping a lot from, and we could see the lowering of the water table. This was a really big problem. They couldn't reliably get water for basic things. The year before Margot ran for office, the city warned it may not be able to pump water to people who lived in the hills. They were draining so much water from under the desert, they couldn't guarantee they'd have enough for firefighting. Margot says Tucson was taking so much water from below the surface the ground itself was moving. So that was one big concern, because now you break sewer pipes, water pipes, gas lines, all the things that are buried underneath, not to mention the impacts on the houses. As we're talking, I notice cracks in the walls of Margot's 100-year-old house. Cracks from the ground sinking under it. So, back in the 70s, things had gotten pretty bad. Tucson really needed new sources of water, but getting it wasn't easy. Many of the people or places they tried to negotiate with didn't want to sell. Even the water Tucson could get would need new infrastructure, which cost money to build. To fund that and to encourage people to use less water, Margot and her colleagues in city leadership started talking about charging more for it. It was to raise the money that we needed to encourage conservation, to give an economic signal for conservation, to recognize that water is valuable. 
up to that point, it had been the opposite. When we came onto the council was the more water you use, the less it cost. It costs less to use more water. So we said, you know, that really doesn't give the message of conservation. The concept of water being more expensive the more you used, that was new. Margot had allies on the city council who also believed water prices needed to go up. One was Barbara Wyman, who had been the first woman elected to Tucson city council. Margot was the second. That made them part of a feminist movement happening across America. Barbara has since moved to California. So on the day I went to Margot's home, we sat around the dining table and called her old friend on Zoom. What was it like for each of you to have another woman on the city council? Barb, you start. (laughs) I was so glad after two years being that only person. Yeah, I'm very proud to have been number two and that Barb was number one. It was fun together and we had similar values, so it was easy. They were excited to get things done. And together, they took the water pricing issue to the people. We held a giant public hearing with several thousand people down at the Tucson Convention Center where everyone time after time got up and said, you know, don't raise our water rates. Whatever you do, don't raise our water rates. And we tried to explain we had to do something because water was the delivery of water was costing more. So Margot and Barbara, with some of their colleagues on the council, went for it. The council voted to put in new pricing for water. People who lived in the hills would pay more since it cost more to deliver water there. And everybody would pay more if they used more water. It did not go over well. I think we put it in place the 1st of May, which is just as the water rates are climbing two and a half times what they are in the winter time. So that was really a, a dumb, dumb move. The bills went out and people started getting those bills. They were very, very upset. And so they would call up the water, <laughs> poor people on the telephone lines at the water department and yell and scream at them. There was one thing I remember. that Remember that fountain in the, the city hall? They were doing their laundry in and taking pictures of the... They had to take their laundry to the city like that. So they were protesting by bringing their laundry to the town hall fountain and doing their laundry in it? Yeah. Wow. Margot and Barbara remember rallies around town and campaigns to get people to call up their city councilors and complain. Just how angry were they? What did they what did they say to you? Well, I got called a lot of bad names, I can tell you, and lots of phone calls in the middle of the night and, you know, destroyed friendships. I mean, it was really sad. She even got a bomb threat. All kinds of death threats. And that, that my, you know, our children suffered because they were all in school. And they had taunting by their classmates and it was really hard on them. That wasn't the end of the fallout for Barbara and Margot. After a break, what happened to them? And was it worth it? Did all that pain change the way people use water? Hey, it's Michael. Thanks for listening to Parched. If you love stories about nature and the American West, I have another show for you to check out. Terra Firma is a podcast that combines the sounds of the outdoors with reflections by writer C. Marie Furman. Find Terra Firma wherever you get your podcasts. Support for this show comes from Alpine Bank. 50 years young, 20 years green. Proud to support Parched from Colorado Public Radio. Learn more about Alpine Bank's history of community service and its green team at alpinebank.com. Support for Parched comes from the Colorado State Fire Service. In Colorado, living alongside nature is a way of life. That includes being ready for wildfire. Learn how to protect homes, property, and communities at livewildfireready.org. The changes Tucson made to its water pricing in the 70s 
were really unusual. So its public campaign to get people on board was unusual, too. They made up a mascot for using less water, especially in the afternoons, the peak time of the day. The mascot is called Pete the Beak. Pete has a normal human body, and then his head is a cartoonish yellow duck with a giant orange beak. Tucson made videos, including this one, where he's lounging by the pool. People in headbands and pink tank tops are dancing around him. And in another one, (laughs) he plays saxophone in a bar. All this, the higher water prices, Pete the Beak, helped usher in a whole new era of conservation in the city. A few years after Margot, Barbara, and other city councilors raised the rates, economists at the University of Arizona studied the results. They found the city needed 45 gallons less per day per person on average. That means people used about a quarter less water than they had before the rates went up. When we came, people sort of wanted to recreate the Midwest, so everybody had big lawns. So when we changed the water rate structure, people did rip out their lawns in the front, and they really did change, and our water per capita water use has continued to go down. Pete the Beak's still around in new videos. He's a Tucson institution. He's everywhere. I stopped to eat lunch at a local deli, and lo and behold, there was a sandwich on the menu called Pete the Greek. But the culture of water conservation took time to build. Because in the immediate aftermath of their vote, the political blowback for Barbara and Margot got more intense. They and a colleague all got recalled over their votes on water pricing. How do you feel about being recalled? Not good. One of the things we could have done, the typical thing to do, would have been to fire the city manager and say, oh, he misled us, all of this was a bad mistake. But we didn't do that because we felt it wasn't a mistake and that it was the right thing to do. We were right in the long run. We changed the whole conversation about water in the state of Arizona. She doesn't have regrets. She was happy with the career she went on to build, teaching urban planning. But she does think the recall has made it harder for other cities to be bold in how they use water pricing to affect water usage. I suspect that what happened to us has scared a lot of people. I mean, there are a lot of people who just are terrified, elected officials, to even start talking about raising water rates. Today, Tucsonians pay an average of about $50 a month for water. Remember Hattie Mathers, the hiker we met crab walking around baby cacti at the beginning of this episode? She pays about the average. I'm curious if her water bill went up when she moved here from the Midwest, since water is so much scarcer here. It's not that much higher. So they need to raise Okay, someone's going to hate me. They need to raise our rates because I still think it's too low. Still, she's paying about double the average Phoenix residents pay. People in Tucson love to roll their eyes at the green lawns they see in Phoenix. Other cities have followed Tucson's lead in raising prices when you use more water. Santa Fe stands out as pretty aggressive. In a city called Irvine Ranch, California, 
that put in block or tiered water pricing starting in the early 90s, residential water use has plummeted. In Irvine Ranch, people get a baseline number of gallons they can use each day. If you use 140% of your baseline, your water bill actually calls you wasteful. On the bill. Pricing doesn't so much affect indoor water, like showers and washing dishes. Robert Glennon points out that the tiered approach ends up affecting outdoor water use, like watering your lawn. A lot of our water use is in the West, especially, is for swimming pools and for lush landscaping. And those are discretionary uses. And they are especially susceptible to encouraging changes in behavior. So if you want a lawn or a pool in the dry Southwest, Robert thinks you should have to pay for it. But here's something to keep in mind. Water pricing is not a simple thing. There are a lot of factors that go into what a utility charges, like what infrastructure upgrades they need to pay for and how many customers they can spread around those costs to. In California, what they can charge is restricted by law. What customers pay has to go directly to the infrastructure it takes to deliver the water. Utilities also need to seriously consider what raising rates would mean for people who can't afford an extra expense. Raising the price of water, for me, absolutely has as a condition that we have a lifeline rate for people of modest means. This was on Margot's mind, too, back in the 70s when they were deciding on the rate structure. And we were very concerned about social equity. We called it a lifeline approach, where there was a minimum amount of water that anyone would get, because we also had a lot of older, retired people. And that was before Social Security became really a big enough number to live on. One option to encourage conservation and still make sure people with low incomes can afford water is to give subsidies, the way we do with home energy bills. This whole idea that there could be real water savings in pricing it differently is based on the assumption that people are using far more water than they actually need to. Pricing will help show people what expenses they need to pay and what they're willing to give up. So no one is suggesting anyone pay more for the water they need for basic human things day to day. Instead, the idea is to pretty sharply raise the price of having things like lawns. Some cities charge more in the summer than the winter to really target those outdoor discretionary things. And it's not just me and other people who live in cities who might pay more for water. It's everyone in the Colorado River Basin. Industries have been built on cheap water for everything from semiconductor plants to farming. The farmers pay next to nothing for water because they got the water from projects that were built intentionally to subsidize the growth of farming economies in the early 20th century. Some people think farmers, who are the very biggest user of Colorado River water, should pay more for it. It's actually being considered by a really big farming district in California. Just like cities, the idea is that farms would get more efficient and use less water if it costs more. We've talked to a half dozen water pricing experts. They all agree that pricing affects how much people use, though they disagree on how much water it saves. There is also the possibility that people will find loopholes, ways to use the same amount of water but avoid the price hikes. In fact, the most unlikely person in Tucson found one for her own home. Margot Garcia the person who helped vote in the higher water rates and gave up her political future for her principles, has found a way around the pricing system that she helped create. 
We've divided our water use, and so we have more at the lower block rate. Remember her beautiful yard we toured? It has a little postage stamp patch of grass and fruit trees and plants to shade the house. Margot's chosen to keep watering all that. So she set up a separate water system with a separate meter, which lets her get more water at a lower rate. We put in a second water system. So we have two meters. One is for the house and one is for the landscaping, which is a little bit playing the system because we do have to irrigate in this property. She admits she's playing the system. So you can call that playing the game if you want. By having the two systems, you are in a way getting around this tiered system, this block system. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's made a big difference. And how much you pay? Several hundred dollars a month in the summer. Wow. Okay, I sound blasé in that moment. That's because I was so startled that I needed a second to catch up. Margot has found a way around the financial incentive to use less water. The incentive she helped create. It's not against the rules. She does it as a financial calculation. She and her husband paid a couple thousand dollars to put the system in, and she says they've already made that money back by shaving off the monthly water bill. In a way, that shows how imperfect pricing is as a solution. But more than that, I think it shows just how much economics influence people's behavior. Money is such a motivating force. It tempts someone like Margot who has dedicated her career and decades of volunteer work to the environment. When it's done right, economic motivation is a real way to help us fix our water problems. To sum it up, charging more for water can make people decide to use less, especially on things that aren't essential, like lawns. What's really intriguing about it is it can also raise awareness about the fact that there's less water, so it can help create buy-in for other solutions. Changing the way we value water is more than a moral question. It's a pocketbook one. But it has limits. Because we can only save so much water at home. In the next two episodes, we're shifting our attention from cities to farms. Because even if every city in the whole Southwest turned off every single tap, we wouldn't solve the Colorado River crisis. The overwhelming majority of water gets used on farms and ranches. I'm headed deep into alfalfa and cow country where the biggest change can happen on the Colorado River. I'm running around the state every chance I get, any person I can talk to that's in agriculture, in the hope that a critical mass, a chorus of voices, can kind of rise up and implore the state to act. I'm not such a big fan of hoping for rain. That's next time on Parched. Hey, it's Michael. Thanks for listening to Parched. I have another show I know you'll love. Ghost Train is about an ambitious plan for commuter rail in Colorado, how it got sidetracked, and where Denver and other cities might go from here. It's a question facing cities across the country. Find Ghost Train wherever you get your podcasts. Support for Parched comes from Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, whose mission is to deepen understanding and promote conservation of alpine plants and fragile mountain environments. Learn how to support these efforts at bettyfordalpinegardens.org.